Well, uh, let me get you caught up to speed on where we are in the series, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, we kind of started this series, and it's after this uh, Stranger Things uh, thing that Netflix put out. And the Stranger Things thing that Netflix put out was basically this sort of sci-fi idea. And, um, and, and in, this, in this show, it's the classic battle of good and evil. And so there's this evil realm that kind of parallels the real world, and the evil realm is called the Upside Down. And uh, the Upside Down is basically um, this part that mirrors it, and eventually the longer you are in or stuck or trapped in this Upside Down, it becomes the normal. And so the dark world, the Upside Down world, begins to influence how you see the world, how you see yourself, how you see other people, and what you think you're supposed to do in this world. And that's sort of where we begin to connect with the show. I would suggest in our world, we are bombarded with these messages that are trying to shape us, uh, redefining what is right and wrong. All of us are constantly bombarded with these kinds of things in our home. We don't have to go looking for them. They're on our entertainment, everywhere. They're constantly, and as a result, we have these battlegrounds of what is right and what is wrong. Even within the walls of the church, battlegrounds are being formed between a group that says, this is right, and other church people say, no, that's wrong. And there's confusion between what is wrong. And usually the evolution of what is right and wrong, hear me on this because this is kind of a, a, a significant thought, but usually the evolution of what is right and wrong tends to cycle toward what is easiest and most convenient. So when there's a fight between what is right and wrong, it's not normal that we wouldn't go up to something more significant or more difficult or more challenging, but we would tend to cycle toward what is easiest and anything that will allow me to express my right as an individual. And we're seeing this plastered in our society right now where there is a, a battle between what's right and wrong. And if you will watch, the people who are trying to redefine what is right are actually trying to make it easier on themselves. So Jesus came to set the upside down, right side up. That was his whole, his whole deal. And the passage of scripture that we kind of been using, that Jesus used to launch his ministry on, this, on the earth, um, is, is called the Sermon on the Mount. And um, we've been focusing on the first 12 verses of, of that sermon. We'll do more throughout, throughout the year. But right out of the gate, Jesus begins his public ministry and he pushes on three major identity pieces in that message. And the three major identity pieces that he, that he pushes on are how we see ourselves, how we see God, and how we see other people. And when he launched this ministry and he launched his, his message to the world, he used this terminology of, of, how, of his kingdom and how things are, are in his kingdom. And, and that's kind of confusing terminology because when God speaks about his kingdom, this is what he means. He means any place where what God wants done is actually done. So your home or your life or your marriage or your parenting or your relationship with your parents, Jesus taught we could allow God's kingdom to expand in our lives and in our families and in our relationships and in our finances and in our sexuality and in our addictions and in our passions, that God is willing to reign in all those areas, but only if we will allow him. We have to invite, invite him into those areas. And then we learned that when Jesus addressed the crowd that day as he launched his ministry, he used this word called anawim. And the anawim is a Hebrew word, and these were basically described imperfect people, afflicted people, or, or needy people, or self-righteous, or arrogant people. In other words, they weren't perfect. <laughs> they, were, they were like us, uh, Anoim. They're, they're people that, you know, we try to say we have it all together, but we probably don't. Or, or we, we try to do the best things we can, but we, we don't always do the best thing we can. They believed their lives were meant to be lived with no clear direction or value. So they didn't understand there's a grander purpose, and they certainly never would have thought of being part of a kingdom. But Jesus taught in the Anawim, to the Anawim, that God can actually change anyone and anything into something kingdom worthy. And that's a big deal. Because what it means is, it's, he doesn't just take the good parts of who I am. He doesn't just take the, the moments where I had a great day and I did everything right, <laughs> but he can take any part of who I am, even the parts that I hope you never find out about, 
even the parts that produce shame in my life, even the parts that I'm not excited about. He can take anything and anyone, even you folks who are kind of concerned the ceiling's going to fall in because you showed up at church today, <laughs> anyone, and turn them into something kingdom worthy. So for our time today, what I want to do is I'm going to go back and revisit one of those major identity markers that, that Jesus pressed on. And just a warning, I'm going to do a lot of kind of, hmm, I don't know, meandering. And then at the end, I'm going to get into the passage. But, but stay with me. I hope, I hope this will be helpful to you. Uh, Jesus set the upside down, right side up, especially when it comes to how people view God. Because everybody in the room has some opinion about who God is. And probably if we put them on a board up here, we would have a wide, varied, diverse group of opinions. There's a girl who was a mystic, Julian of Norwich, one of the greatest Christian mystics we have. If you ever want to read Christian mystics, just Google it. You'll find some people. Um, but she once described God this way. Completely relaxed and courteous, he was himself the happiness and peace of his dear friends. His beautiful face radiating, radiating measureless love like a marvelous symphony. And it was that wonderful face shining with the beauty of God that filled that heavenly place with joy and light. And I read something like that and wonder, what was Julianne smoking to actually think she sees God that way? Because there's nothing in me that relates to a God described like this. There's nothing in me that makes that I've ever thought about seeing God like this. Let me, let's put it more, in, more closer to today. We used to sing this song in church world. I don't know if you grew up in church or not, but you're, you may be familiar with the song. But it always made me uncomfortable. And the reason the song made me uncomfortable was because it asked me to look Jesus full in his face. And that just wasn't something I thought I should do. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Can we sing that together? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Ah, such a beautiful song, and I get what the songwriter's saying. But what I wrestled with was my understanding, my concept of God, had nothing to do with looking God full in the face. I just wasn't comfortable of thinking God. And I'm thinking of God in that way. In fact, when I'd read the Old Testament, anybody that saw God got jacked up. And so like, man, I'm not sure that I want to look God full in his face. Maybe some of you can, uh, can relate to that. I, I trust I'm not the only one who thought of God not as a face that I really wanted to look at. In fact, if I'm really honest, I would see God primarily growing up as being angry or frowning. I saw God as kind of not satisfied with what's going on on the earth, what's going on on the planet, or what's going on in me. And so any idea that I would want to look him eyeball to eyeball. So the question, when I'd hear people like me talk about how everybody could have a personal, intimate relationship with God, my question is, why would you want to? I mean, basically God's going to be fire insurance to make sure I can avoid the hell thing, but why would I want to spend time and hang out with God in any other time? So in the past, I think that maybe our concepts of God was often a projection of our anger and frustration in trying to follow God. Let me explain what I'm saying. We found ourselves frustrated because we had one church over here, one denomination over here, and we made this list of, people, of what it meant to follow God. And so we had a list here, and we couldn't keep the list. We pretended like we could keep the list, but we really couldn't keep the list. And so we found ourselves frustrated by the list that we couldn't keep. 
And then we fought angers, anger, because not only were we frustrated, but then we would look at your life and see that you couldn't keep the list either. And then we'd get mad at you, really because we're mad at ourselves, because nobody could keep the list. Did you all follow that at all? Yeah, I, I don't, some, half of you were like, nope. Well, I know, try, see if we can catch on. I didn't do a great job at that. As a result of this whole thing of the way people see God and fighting anger and seeing God as angry, a hypocrisy began to form in church circles. People who pretended they were something they weren't. So we would speak of God forgiving us. And that was a good thing that we all received. But the problem was we couldn't forgive ourselves. And so we come in a room like this and we believe God forgives, but we didn't, didn't know how to get rid of our own shame and guilt and the things that we messed up. Or we, we talk about forgiving other people. And we gather in a church like this and we say, yeah, well, I'm good at forgiving other people. I mean, I saw a person at the checkout line the other day. They were in the 12 item line. They had 14 items. I forgave them. It's just no big deal. And, and I believe you. The problem is forgiving the person who deeply wounded you. The problem is forgiving mom or dad for, for messing up when they raised you. The problem is forgiving a relative. The problem is forgiving what happened on that, on that date that shouldn't have happened, whatever. That's the problem. And then we spoke of caring for other people. But the poor and needy continued to be neglected, not just out there, but in our neighborhood. We heard about holiness, but we didn't believe it was possible for us. And we certainly don't see it in you. And we got, God spoke of loving each other. And so we surrounded ourselves with people who were just like us because they're easy to love. But when it came to other people that weren't like us, loving became more difficult. And as a result of this sort of frustrated faith, the church started to paint God as this punishing God. This God who has this big book with a pencil with an eraser on it. And he would write your name down on days you did good things, and then he'd erase it when you didn't do anything good. And then when there's like some kind of payment for those wrongdoings, that he would punish us. And then hellfire preachers would apply their messages of guilt by shouting about the narrow way of salvation and making us afraid of hell. And if the ground's opening up, going to swallow you into hell right now, you better repent and all those kinds of things. So the church, as a result, became driven by fear and shame and guilt and failure hypocrisy and inauthenticity and our relationship to God begin to reflect that. So we started to see God as frustrated and angry and vindictive. And then we wrestled because who wants to have a personal relationship with that? If you view me as frustrated, angry, and vindictive, you probably aren't going to ask me out for coffee. If I see you in the lobby and you've got a frustrated, angry, vindictive face, I'm going to avoid you. And you would avoid me. And yet somehow we were asked to relate to this kind of God. It didn't just stay there. It started to develop. We added some other stuff to that understanding of God. In conservative circles, the old punishing God we added to that God right theology and right doctrine. So we desire to be right, and that's the supreme value, and we really don't care who it hurts. Being right becomes the most important thing, and by being right, I mean having theology that is right above anyone else's. God is still portrayed as one who wears a frown, and he's angry at all those other churches that aren't right. And he looks at the church and he sees this confused, morally lax, lazy, sexually promiscuous people. And God only cheers up when a good theological argument wins on Facebook. And that became most important to us. You say, Tom, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. I, I don't think so. In fact, if you read your history, if I'm not mistaken, Christian people killed other Christian people over their theology. Not only that, but you drove by 36 Baskin-Robbins flavors on the way here of other denominations proving that Christian people couldn't get along with what was right. And we formed this theology division. And it became the most important thing. And then the other side of things, if those are the conservative people, then you have the liberal kind of side of things. And 
in the liberal side of things, I think we're sort of creating a God who is depicted as anxious and hypersensitive and politically correct and trying to appease everybody. This is where God seems to be having an identity crisis. It's no longer about who's right and I don't care who, hurt, who it hurts, who I hurt with it. Now it's about how can I be something, be everything. And God is now weak and sniveling, looking to the very ones who he created to help enlighten him and his understanding of the modern world. And yet even this God wears a frown. When this God looks at the world, the spontaneous reaction isn't a blessing, but one of disapproval. And he, he marvels at our lack of social conscience. So we have these two extremes, it seems like. We have these folks over here that want to have right theology and, and make sure we all have right doctrine and we're willing, we're willing to fight whoever for it. And then you got these people over here are basically trying to reinvent God based on their opinion or what's common. And both extremes are producing a God that I don't think I want to have a personal relationship with. And then you have the biblical record of what God did when he created Genesis, when he created the world in Genesis 1 and 2. And we see that immediately after God creates every item in his creation, he looks at that item and he says, this is good. He looks at every item and he says, it's good. And after all creation is finished, God has a Campbell soup moment. And he says, this is not just good, it is mm -mm good. This is very good when he sees all of creation. That original blessing, that view of appreciation has never changed. Despite the existence of evil and despite the existence of sin, what God made is still good. He is still pleased. He still appreciates what he made. You actually see this in the New Testament in the beginning of the Gospels and Jesus is baptized by his cousin John the Baptist and right after he comes out of the water, we just said this a couple weeks ago, voice from heaven opens up, heavens open up and a voice says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I would suggest just as it was at creation, God is looking upon the earth and seeing it as good. Are you saying God doesn't see sin in the world? No, no, I'm not saying that. Hold on. But I do think he sees good. If you have ever had a, a baby, well, we just did it, didn't we? If you've ever had the, the dedication of a baby, and a baby there pop out, you know? You get the idea? I think God sees that and says it's good. Grandbabies, some of y'all old, I know you got grandbabies. You think God doesn't look at that grandbaby and say that's good? You ever plant something in the ground and watch some green push up through the dirt and produce something? You think God doesn't look at that and say, hey, that was good, wasn't it? Look at that. Hey, come here, angels, check this out. That's good. You ever been to the beach? Y'all go to the beach this summer? You go to the mountains, you go to Colorado? You think God didn't look out there with you and your camera or your phone and say, yeah, that's good. That's good. I would suggest that the awareness of God's smile upon the planet, fallen as it is, was very much part of the everyday mindset of Jesus. Because Jesus carried a message we had never heard before. And he related to people and ministered to people in a way the church had never seen and the world had never seen before. And to understand Jesus' teaching and his attitude, it can be helpful to imagine that throughout his entire life, he had this message on repeat in his mind of God speaking to him and whispering into his ears, you're my boy whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. Let me ask you. What's the message on repeat in your mind that God's sending your way? Anybody else got one of those 
you were good except for your 20s. And I'll never forget it. You're good except for the computer thing. You're good except, anybody got one of those messages going? I wonder if like any parent's influence on a child, those words helped form the consciousness of Jesus, assuming he had a consciousness, which I'm assuming he did. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. Therefore, when Jesus looks at the Anawim, the poor and the hungry and the weeping and the adulterers and the cheats and the needies and the afflicted and the, and the possessed, he looks at them and instead of seeing where they are weak, he calls them blessed. Jesus had within him a concept of God, a God who was pleased, smiling, and blessing the earth. And as a result, Jesus too looked at us in our jacked up lives, and he saw in us something worth smiling and blessing. So how about you? Do you see God as pleased, smiling, and blessing? Or do you see God as angry, unpleasable, and wearing a frown? A couple of years ago, before Henry Nouwen died, he wrote this book called Return of the Prodigal Son. And it's basically a commentary on Rembrandt's famous painting, by the same title, Return of the Prodigal Son. And um, it's kind of a cool uh, book if you ever get a chance to read it. And, uh, and, and now I'm points out a bunch of stuff about, about Rembrandt's painting. First of all, he points out that this is the father, which is the God figure in, in, the, in the story and in the painting. And now he points out a couple things about the God figure. First of all, he's got his eyes closed, or some people suggest Rembrandt's saying that the father's blind. And then he also points out that there's two different kinds of hands. One is a masculine hand and one's a female hand. And now he points out the masculine hand is with strength and clutching the prodigal son to his chest while the female hand is nurturing and comforting because the prodigal son is broken. His eyes are shut, hands are holding the prodigal son and what now it suggests, it says this, it's because God does not look with his eyes, but God looks with his heart. The God figure is clutching the fallen son or daughter. And Rembrandt is saying, God sees not the, not the pig slop he's been rolling in, not all the mistakes he made in his life, but he sees the heart. The other characters of the, of the story are also there. You have the loving father, you have the prodigal, and of course you got the older brother. And the painting sort of invites us to see ourselves in each of these characters. We see ourselves in the weakness of the prodigal son. We've all been to that point of brokenness, I would think, where we have made such a mess of things. <laughs> we don't know what to do other than to ask for mercy. We certainly can see ourselves over here and the body language of this dude, the older brother, is not hard to read. Arms crossed, condescension, judgment, looking down on the prodigal. But what Jesus and perhaps Rembrandt is inviting us to identify with in the painting is the father. And is all-embracing, all-forgiving, caressing compassion. And at the end of the day... That's what we are called to in the spiritual life. We are meant to receive and radiate both God's embrace and compassion for all people, even people who repulse us, and we all have that list. In order to be able to do this, God is going to have to change the way we perceive him. 
to have the courage to let ourselves be embraced when we are sinful and bitter is to first of all know a God who as Jesus and Julian of Norwich and Rembrandt and Nowen assures us is both a blessing caring father who sees with the eyes of his heart and who, despite our weaknesses and anger, this God sits relaxed, smiling, with his face like a marvelous symphony, according to Julian. And this all was precursor to get us into the passage that we've been studying. Beatitudes are broken up into triplets. You can actually divide them up into three in the curve, and there's different topics you can, you can pick out for yourself. We've talked about the first three. Uh, the first three of the, of the triplets are this. They said, Jesus started the message. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the first one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Second one. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So these first three of this Beatitudes sort of strike at the attitudes common in this life. And the distinction of what life in the kingdom will look like versus life outside of the kingdom. Because Jesus calls attention to poor in spirit and mourning and, and the meek. All traits outside of the kingdom would not be valued. But inside the kingdom they are valued and rewarded. And these first three are vital. Because if we don't get these first three, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount isn't going to do anything for us. These first three show us the extent of God's invasion of us, God's kingdom coming in us. It takes away our very self-centered life and gets us ready for the most amazing selfless love we have ever heard. Everything that follows rests on this. Now listen, this is so important. Unless the removal of self happens in our hearts, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount will be impossible. Unless there's some kind of death to self, the rest of this will not make sense. And that gets us to the second group of three. Jesus goes on to say, self is done, meek, mourning. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Jesus uses the strongest cravings we know, the Anawim would have known, to characterize those who have this passion for justice and righteousness. It's interesting to note, it is only once I allow God's kingdom to come in me that I can truly begin a healthy quest for righteousness. If the self doesn't die, then I never have a quest for righteousness. I have a quest for self-righteousness. If I do not allow God's kingdom to come in me to address myself first, then I will be self-righteous and hypocritical. I will see what is wrong with you or wrong with the church or wrong with your pastor or wrong with your small group, but I will miss that I cannot even love my own family and I harbor unforgiveness. But even the quest for righteousness is supported by the next beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Righteous people are not naturally merciful. We do not look at the shortcomings of each other with mercy. And our very passion for righteousness can produce this hardness and this bitterness and this condemnation and even damnation toward other people. And righteousness unmodified by mercy is this hard, unlovely, pharisaical, judgment kind of thing that's running people out of the church. But nothing is more beautiful than when righteousness and mercy go hand in hand. If you've kind of had a hard time following me, this next slide is kind of what the whole thing's about. So you could just kind of take a picture of this and you got it. You know, this is basically it. E. Stanley Jones says this. Righteousness that stood straight and towered, learned to stoop in mercy, and conquered in the stooping. I'll read it again, because it's got to sink in, right? Righteousness that stood straight and towered, learned to stoop in mercy, and conquered in the stooping. And here, my friends, is the crux of what the modern church is facing. Respectfully, I would suggest it's probably the crux of what you are facing in your own life. 
It's what we're all facing. You will align one way or the other with one of these. Righteousness needs the flavoring of mercy or it's just judgmental and hypocritical. Mercy needs the flavoring of righteousness or it's going to be empty and worthless. We cannot be a community of people who just winks our eyes at everything because ultimately it means you stand for nothing. And we can't be a community of people that are so judgmental, so condemning, that we invite people to follow a God that nobody wants to relate to. We cannot be a community of people who just play one of these two cards. We cannot say we're righteous, but have no mercy. We cannot be merciful, but have no righteousness. We must be a community who boldly, uncomfortably gives mercy to all people. But we do so because of our deep belief that God is making us righteous. What I'm trying to say is I think we must be known as a body for our commitment to grace and truth. Our commitment to grace and righteousness. Mercy and righteousness become our constant dance partners. And here's the bomb diggity. When those two are put together, the third one of the triplet can now become our reality. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The best definition of pure in heart can be seen in the prior two verses. Who are the pure in heart? People that have a hunger for righteousness and a mercy for people. Hunger for righteousness and mercy for people. This is what it means to be pure in heart. It literally means to not have a divided heart. Which leads to so what, Tom? <laughs> I told you at the beginning of the series that I almost feel like God is maybe purifying some things in our church. And man, um, the fear related to this message and these messages is significant simply because you're afraid of being misunderstood. And so, you know, I've heard things in the community, does that mean Alive Now does this or Alive or whatever? Um, I'm not trying to do any of that. Here's my concern. If we become a church committed to just righteousness, just righteousness, well, our doctrine may be pure as the driven snow. That's valuable and important. Right thinking about God is vital to any community. But if our interest lies only in being right, then I fear we're in danger of whittling God's love down to our systematic theology that is on its best day incomplete. We become a group of people known for thinking we're right while ignoring our neighbors condemned to hell and we don't care. And this, I'm convinced, doesn't please God and I don't think it reflects his heart. On the other hand, if we become a church committed to just mercy, we'll become a community where everything is okay and everything's accepted. And our attempts to take a hard stand on anything will actually mean we actually stand for nothing. So what would we invite people that don't do this on Sunday morning to come and do? Hey, come to our church. What do y'all do? Well, nothing different really than what you do. We just, we just get together. We will reach everybody but ultimately have nothing to offer them when they come if we just land on mercy. And what we'll do is we'll establish our own set of rights and wrongs as a community. This is happening all across churches right now, all over the place. 
and we'll establish our own set of rights and wrongs until they offend someone, and then we'll change them again. Or until culture says, y'all are messed up, and then we'll change it so that culture doesn't say we're messed up. You see, we can't have one without the other. We can't have righteousness without mercy and mercy without righteousness. We need them both to, have, to be pure in heart. So allow me to just sort of drop these questions on you to allow you to process this week. First of all, is the way you're seeing God clouding your heart, when's the last time you viewed God as looking at you, smiling, and saying you are good? Because everything I read in Scripture indicates that's how Jesus sees me. But I sort of stink at that way of thinking. So I have growth to do there. I have growth that needs to happen there. Here's the other two questions. And you will gravitate toward one of these. We could divide the room. We could divide Christendom in this division. Is your hunger for righteousness balanced with mercy? Is your hunger for mercy balanced with righteousness? Which one of those is your question? Why are you here? Only then, when we can love each other, only then, in righteousness and mercy, only then do we see God as he really is. So we'll be a church that does this awkward dance between righteousness and mercy. Not my righteousness. But what scripture teaches righteousness is. And when someone comes to pull down a teaching in scripture, or someone says, maybe that's not what God meant, well, then we'll approach those conversations with mercy. And hopefully we'll treat people with mercy, even if we don't believe the same or agree the same. But only in the context of righteousness. Together, grace and truth. Give it a whirl. Thank you, Lord, so much for these good folks. Thank you for the opportunity to spend some time with them. I pray now, Lord, that you would use these words to challenge us. Mercy people, righteousness people. Lord, I think my biggest prayer all morning is that people that see you as this vindictive, angry God would find a God that Smiles. This is my child. I love that. I love that child. I am well pleased. And that would become what shapes us. That would become the context that allows us to flourish, allows us to question things, allows us to seek answers. And Lord, as you place us in areas of influence, whether you give us relationships or children or our workplace, we could pass on to this next generation. We could pass on a God who smiles. A God who hates sin. But man, he loves his creation. Yes, he hates sin. But when he started launching his kingdom and stood on the side of the hill, he called us all blessed. None of us had given our heart to God. None of us had a fish on a car. None of us had been baptized or dedicated. We just were all sitting there with our jacked up lives. And Jesus launches his new kingdom and he looks at us and says, Ah, you are blessed people. So Lord, guide this church in your mercy and in your righteousness in your name.